Hello, it's Philip Taylor from Richmond Green Chambers speaking. What a fascinating book here, it's a slim one. It's again from Sweet and Maxwell. It's a third edition now of Conflicts of Interest, written by Charles Hollander, Queen's Counsel, and Simon Salzido, if I pronounce the name correctly. There's a picture of the book there, and in fact I've written a fairly substantial review. It's an interesting book. It follows very much the the line of Sweet and Maxwell publications again. Tables of contents, then you've got uh, paragraph numbers on the sides, and at the back you've got again a, a useful uh, index, and of course as I say it's not a particularly uh, large book. It goes to about just over 300 pages. I shall pop it there and you can have a look at it while I'm talking about it. I've written a review which is going to appear shortly because this is a, a new edition and it's an important work. I've called the review Resolving Some Conflicts. And I say that because it starts off, actually, the very first edition, with a religious comment. It's an, actually an extract from the Bible, uh, from St. Matthew, and it talks about the relationship uh, between people who have different masters. Because what we're talking about here is our relationships with various people. Because there are going to be occasions, it happens all the time, where you want to please one person, but at the same time you want to please someone else. And there's going to be a conflict. And that's when you have to start looking and seeing what you're going to do, whatever sphere of work you're involved in. Obviously, in commercial terms, this is an area where we have to look at things carefully. It's also important from the professional viewpoint, uh, as lawyers, particularly as solicitors. I'll come on to that in a minute. The question that we really pose here, though, is can a lawyer or other professional act for or advise, say, both Tesco's and Sainsbury's at the same time? Now, we have this sort of problem as barristers. They say, well, how can you prosecute and defend? How can you act for a claimant and a defendant, or a landlord and a tenant? This sort of stuff. And it's easy. The job I do is to represent the views of my client. And I do that with the skills of advocacy I have at my disposal, and my knowledge of the law, and the strength of the case. And I'm actually required, as everybody is, to make sure we don't mislead the court. So if it's clear that there's some information that needs to be uh, announced, the whole purpose, certainly in the civil justice process, is to make sure we have what used to be called discovery. That's, in fact, making the documents available. But what we've got here is the question, can you serve two masters? So Conflicts of Interest, which is in a new edition, is Sweet and Maxwell's definitive authoritative guide to the subject which explores these and related issues in detail. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It's a, uh, a detailed book. It's a, a relatively slim one, but it's got a lot of information in it. What Hollander and Salzito have done is they've looked at a range of professional sectors from law, accountancy and finance to things like estate agency and insurance and they've examined how the problems of conflict of interest may uh, be prevented or resolved, including strategies for assessing and managing conflict situations. You've actually got a little bit of risk management coming in here. You've also got a little bit of ADR probably too, because obviously the aim is to try to avoid going to court if you possibly can. It's almost strange to note that before the first edition of Conflict was published in 1998, so it's just 10 years old now, there were few decisions in this area, and the most important previous case before the courts, uh, the English courts, was decided in 1912. Now, before the last 10 years have, have gone through, and the second edition, there uh, have been a proliferation of cases, obviously uh, f 10 years after the main decision of uh, Bolkaya. I'm not going to say much about that because it's very well covered in the um, text. The table of cases at the front uh, has over a dozen pages and obviously the number of cases almost too numerous to count again. But it's a useful area and of course there is the table of statutes and statutory instruments as well as a good index at the back 
to make the book much more easy to use as a means of reference for comparatively uh, a comparatively complex body of material which the authors have assembled here. Mr. Justice uh, Aikins actually observed in the forward to the first edition that, quote, this book is a trailblazer, the first in which any concerted attempt has been made to explore the extent of the rules against conflict of interest in modern English law. <clears throat> he adds that with commercial competition becoming uh, even fiercer in the 21st century, company directors, all types of advisers, judges and politicians will be forced to be even more scrupulous to avoid possible conflicts of interest. That's something many people will be familiar with because of the position of politicians in particular, because they are very high profile. Of course, the media, certain elements of the media, love to talk about that at, at some length. So what have we got with the third edition? Well, what we've got here is it continues to augment the primary aim of the original work, which was to stimulate debate in areas where there is a, at present a dearth of English authority. So what it is, in fact, it's a precedent in its own way, because the authors are looking at how we, we actually assess conflicts of interest. And it covers a number of areas. I'll give you just a, a few. Things like remedies for preventing or resolving conflicts of interest, judicial conflict itself, that could be bias. Think administrative law here and, and some of the rules of natural justice. Obligations to disclose information, well we know about that from CPR and what we have. The duty to the other side, to keep them informed and start hiding things. And fed up with being actually you know, right on the door of the court being ambushed by the other side. I don't like that, it happens, but you've got to try and avoid it if you can. Conflicts of interest in intellectual property, of course, and things like information barriers um, within organisations, what we knew as sort of Chinese walls a few years ago. We, we, we have them and we're going to get more of that sort of thing as our society gets more complex and certainly much more intelligent approaches, hopefully, towards business relations develop. Of special note, I think, which I referred to at the beginning of this review, is the 2007 Code of Conduct for the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority. I appreciate that there could well be some changes taking place in the next few years, but we've got the Code of Conduct, and that is very important. Obviously, the bar, my, my own profession, we have our own rules as well. But the Code contains a, a cogent body of rules which are perceived to be significantly stricter than the common law and probably rightly to because of the relationship both solicitors and barristers have with clients especially solicitors because they deal with the money this then in my view is a brilliant book not just for lawyers but for anyone who requires a clear lucid and detailed examination of the entire subject of conflict of interest and in fact it touches almost all aspects of contemporary life and work at the moment so it's actually a good read, apart from anything else, even though it's a heavy one. Not the book, the contents. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.